This lesson is for section 5.7, Exponential Growth and Decay. We're going to be assuming continuous growth and continuous decay throughout these uh, application problems. So let's take a look first at an exponential growth function in just the general form. Notice that we're getting uh, this curve here. So this is the graph of an exponential growth function, and this is the general form for your equation. Now, a and b here are both positive constants. And this will always result in something that looks very similar to this graph. Now, with exponential decay, a is positive, but b is going to be negative, resulting in actually a reflection across the, uh, the y-axis here, so that now you have a graph that's function looks like this. So in this section, we're going to be looking at population growths, global warming, radioactive decay, all assuming that we have continuous growth or decay. All right, so let's start with a population growth model. So this is the general form for a population growth model. And notice that it looks almost identical to our uh, continuous interest uh, equation that we used yesterday. And it's supposed to look the same. It's pretty much the exact same idea. So a lot of this is going to be pretty familiar to you. Um, but we will be solving now for k oftentimes. Um, and that's part of what we're going to do in the second question here. Now k is your growth constant whereas we used R before as our rate, um, or our interest rate, our continuous interest rate. Now, um, n naught, so n sub 0, which is also pronounced n naught, um, is the size of your population when it starts, so at time is 0. Now, in this question here, it says, in 2000, the nations of Mali and Cuba had similar size populations. However, the growth rates were different. So there are different growth rates here. Now, assuming continuous exponential growth at these given rates, what projections would be made for the population in the year 2015? So what we're going to do here is assume that we're starting in the year 2000. So that's going to be t equals 0. So two, t equals 0 represents the year 2000. Now, what we're going to do then is say, all right, if it's 2015 that we're trying to make projections for, we're going to let t equal 15 for both. Now, the, the exponential growth model is going to be different for each of these because the growth constant is different. Okay, That k value is going to be different for each one. So we start, let's do uh, Molly's. Molly's model will be used y equals the starting amount, which was 11.2. So this is the starting amount here. I, I also used y here. I shouldn't probably use y. It's going to just be n or the population. I'm going to use p, actually for population. So the population is equal to 11.2, so p naught. The population at time is 0, times e to the kt power. Now we also already know k, the growth constant, and the time here, so I'm just going to plug those both right in. So I have the population is equal to 11.2 times e to the 0 0.031 times 15. So I can just do that calculation and stick that right in my calculator. Make sure that you put this in parentheses so that when you raise that to this power, it's um, doing the correct order of operations here. So I'll let you guys do um, the same thing for uh, Cuba. OK, so the population uh, for Cuba is pretty straightforward here. But I do want to make a note that that population um, now has such a vast difference here because your growth constant was so much larger um, for Mali. And uh, after just 15 years, you really see a separation in their population. Now in part B, we're asked to find T because it asks us when will the population reach 20 million. So here we're, we're going to be solving for T using our same exponential growth model. And we have already the outcome of uh, the population. So we want to know when it's going to reach 20 million. So I have 20 equals 11.2 times E to the 0 0.031 T. So now to isolate t here, I just simply solve this as an exponential model that, or, um, as an exponential equation here that I want to solve for. So I'm going to end up taking the log of both sides. First, though, divide out that 11.2 and further isolate the t here. So I have 20 over 11.2 equals e to the 0 0.031 t. And then I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of e is going to cancel here, and I'm left with 0.031t equals the natural log of 20 over 11.2. To further isolate, I'm going to divide out the 0.031, and I'm left with t equals the natural log of 20 over 11.2 divided by 0.031. So rather than um, calculating this like piece by piece here, and then using a, a rounded answer, 
we're going to store this in our calculator. Alright, so as you can see, I've typed this into my calculator and I'm going to get an answer of approximately 18.7 years. So after about 18.7 years, that Molly's population will, will grow to be 20 million. Now I want to use this answer in part uh, 2 of part B, where it says what would the population of Cuba be at the exact same time. So I need to use this time, the exact same time, in order to uh, find their population. So it's really a question similar to question A at this point now, since you already know the time, you know the, con the growth constant, you know the starting amount. But what I want to do is practice storing this in your calculator so you get an accurate answer. So you're going to now hit, now that you have your answer here, you can store this as X or B or anything really that you want by hitting alpha. And then um, A here is now going to store that as the variable A. So when I go to um, calculate this, I'm going to now stick in my calculator e to the point zero seven one or point zero zero seven I think it was actually point zero zero seven times and then all I have to do is hit alpha a here and now it's going to store use that stored answer here and then multiply this by eleven point one that was the starting amount for Cuba in order to get their approximate population twelve point six five million. So question number one was very straightforward. In question two, this is going to be what you're typically asked to do. You're going to be given um, some limited uh, information, and you'll be usually asked to solve for k. Since we just gave you the growth constant in the first example, it was really easy to calculate a lot of that. You just stuck it right in your calculator. Here we're going to actually solve, though, for the growth constant. So it says at the start of an experiment, you have 1,500 bacteria. Two hours later, the size of the population has jumped to 1,750. So we're going to still assume exponential growth here that is continual. So um, the first question with how many bacteria were there after one and a half hours? Well, we have the time, but we're still missing k. So we always usually have two steps when we're, when we're doing these application problems, and that's to use the given information to find k, and then you go back to answer the actual question. So let's start with our growth model. So n equals n sub 0 times e to the kt. And again, you could use population P and P naught. doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. So we have 1,500 as our starting amount times E to the K times. We have two hours later. So we're going to do 2K here. And our end result, the last um, the amount of population here was 1,750. And we'll solve now for K. So we've actually done this problem almost exactly like this, the last question we had. We solved for T. So now it's very similar. You're going to isolate the uh, k here as best you can by dividing first by 1700. Uh, by 1500. So you have 1750 divided by 1500 equals e to the 2k. Now take the natural log of both sides. And you have 2k equals the natural log of 1750 over 1500. So now we'll divide out the 2 to isolate k. And you again will store this value. And I would actually use uh, K when you're storing this. That way it's pretty straightforward when you go, you know, to plug in everything from here on out. So I believe now that you should be able to do part A and part B. So I'd like you to do those and then actually check with the key here because I think it'd be a waste of time for me to do both of those again and, and I'll give you practice. All right, now part C, it says how long does it take for the population to double? So we're going to assume that uh, that would be 3,000, right? And we start off with 1,500. And we have E, we know our growth constant. I'm just going to remind you that, that we already know K, but we do not know T. Now, if I wanted to solve for T and I wanted to isolate that, I would divide out that 1,500, and I'm going to be left with 2. So I have 2 equals E to the KT. Now, this is the exact same model you'll have for every type of exponential growth um, model because you'll always have this value after you divide out your population, you will always have that equaling 2 whenever you're asked to double the population. So if we solve this general form here and take the natural log of both sides, we end up with a very um, nice little equation here that gives us the doubling time. So once I would divide out um, k, this gives me the doubling time. And I hope you recognize that from yesterday also when we did um, the compound interest stuff. It's the exact same expression to give us their doubling time. So you can kind of cut to the chase and do this, this equation here if you can remember that. But really it just comes from setting this up and solving. 
Okay, so I would let you guys also figure out the doubling time here and check with the key. All right, now the next application that we're going to focus on is, again, a real-life application here is um, half-life and radioactive decay. So this really freaks me out, but um, the amount of nuclear waste that we have in this country is insane. Um, we, are, we have currently over 77,000 tons of waste, and in order for that to not be dangerous, it'll take literally thousands and thousands of years. Um, plutonium-239, which is, I think, everywhere, um, will take 240,000 years for it to become safe. So whenever a scientist refers to half-life, they're referring to how long it would take for half of a sample to decay. So it doesn't, it's an innate property in the sample. It doesn't mean like the more waste you have, the, the um, more amount of time. It doesn't matter the size or sample. It's, it's the exact same amount of time for a small sample than it would be for a large sample for its um, half-life. So when we talk about half-life, we are referring to how long it takes for half of the radioactive material to turn into lead, something safe. All right, so you'll notice that the half-life model is exactly the same. Um, the only difference is that our K value is going to be negative. Um, our decay constant is negative because it's a decay model. Now, I also talked about this already, but I just want to reiterate the half-life is an intrinsic property of a substance, so it does not depend on the given sample size. So if it's a small little bitty t sample size or a very large sample size, it takes the same amount of time in order for it to decay to, half of, um, to, to have a half-life. All right, so part three here, problem three, says the half-life of radium-226 is 1,620 years. And then it asks how much of an initial two-gram sample remains after five years. So this is jumping right in and asking you a question um, about the sample. But first, we need to figure out what's K. So here again, we're going to find K first, and then we will answer our question. So going back to our given, it says the half-life of this radioactive substance is 1,620 years. So we're given a lot less information than we were before in the bacteria problem. But basically, let's think of this hypothetically. No matter what the actual original sample size is, so n naught, whatever we started with, for a half-life, what we have, what we expect to be left over, the n, should be half of the original amount, n naught. So this is what you're going to set n equal to in your function here, n equals n naught times e to the kt. We already know n naught. We're going to keep that the same, the original sample size. But n, we are now going to substitute this value in for n, so half of n naught. And then if I finish off the problem here, I'm left with this. Now, I already know time. I know that it takes 1,620 years, so I'm going to plug in 1,620 years here. Let's erase that. Whoa, that is not erasing. There we go. So times 1,620 here. And if I want to solve for k and isolate the k, I would divide out that n naught. So this ends up canceling out. So anytime you're doing really a half-life problem and solving for k, you can assume that you have one half um, on your equation in the left side because the, the initial substance amount is going to cancel out. So you have one half equals e to the 1,620 times k. We will take the natural log of both sides. And we end up with a natural log of 1 half equaling uh, 1,620k. Now to solve for k, we would divide out the 1,620. And we end up with k equaling the natural log of 1 half divided by 1,620. Now I would like you to store this value here in your calculator, but I want you to also notice that you do get a negative value for k. It is supposed to be a negative value, and that's how you can check to make sure that you're doing something correctly because your, your growth constant here, which in fact is actually a decay constant, should end up being negative. So now you'll use this um, using the 2 gram sample after 5 years, and this is really a straightforward problem. Again, you're just plugging in the values now where you already have your k value. Store this. Um, and then part b is what I want to help you guys with. So you guys can do part a on your own. Part B says, find the time required for 80% of the 2 gram sample to decay. Now, for 80% of the 2 gram sample to decay, this is um, a problem where it's actually better to think about what would be left over. So remember, when we did the half-life, we said half of it would be left over, and this is the equation that we ended up having to solve for, for our k value. This time, we're going to be solving for t, obviously, because it says find the time. But it will be a very similar setup. If 80% of the 2 gram sample is supposed to decay, that means 20% is actually left over. So for part B, it's smarter to think about what's left over here because we can set that equal to 
our end result here. So our, our um, decay, our final decay amount, our, our, I'm sorry, our final, final sample here is going to be 20% of the original. So 20% of n sub naught. And no, notice that those will cancel just like they did before when we set this up. These n sub naughts will cancel after we solve, you know, the rest of that equation here. So that 0.20, I can, I'm going to rewrite that as one fifth. Uh, just to clean it up a little bit more, but you can also write it as 0 0.20. It really makes no difference. But we'll have one fifth is equal to e times our k value, which we have already stored. So I'm just going to write k again, and then t. And we're going to solve now for t, very similarly to what we did before. We'll just take the natural log of both sides. So we have the natural log of one fifth equals k t, and then we'll divide out that k because we know the k constant. So divide out k, and we have t equals the natural log of one fifth divided by k. Again, make sure you, you uh, store that value so you don't have to plug that in every single time. Or I'm sorry, the, the k value should be stored in there already, so you don't have to plug that in every single time. But that's essentially what you're going to be doing for these types of problems. So um, just to reiterate, the growth and decay models are the exact same. The only difference is k will be positive if it's a growth, negative it's if, it, if it's a decay. So there's the end of the lesson. Nice job. I'll see you guys in class manana.